Right, welcome to the Veterans in Politics uh, Judicial Endorsement Interviews for 2012. We'd like to start by saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please have a seat. Veterans in Politics International represents military veterans and family of military veterans whose voices would otherwise go ignored or unheard. They help us understand the past and present of political and military events so that we can inform for the future and not repeat history. I'd like to first start off by introducing our panel members in no particular order. First off on, on the end there is uh, Travis Barrett, who is an attorney. Mr. William Brown, who is also an attorney. Ms. Teresa Price, who is retired from the United States Air Force. Ms. Lindsay Jameson, who is Miss UNLV. Mr. Jim Jonas, who's an activist and radio host for Veterans in Politics. Karen Steelman, standing on the corner over there, who's the auxiliary director and radio host for Veterans in Politics. Melody Howard, who is the president of uh, the Nevada chapter and USA of uh, Veterans in Politics. Dan Berry, retired Metro Police Officer. My name is Jason Brooks, I'm Staff Sergeant, United States Marine Corps, retired, Hoorah. <laughs> and Karen's also going to be helping out working with the camera, and of course, Steve Sanson, everybody knows Mr. Sanson. And uh, working the door over there is Kelly, and don't uh, be offended by, like, if I don't pronounce your last name correctly, but um, Sisnajewski, close enough? Okay, thank you for that. All right. <laughs> and I'm sorry, Mr. Uh, Richard Hawkins, who's also an attorney. A lot of attorneys here. All right. Well, that'll be an economist today. All right. So the the first interviews that we have going on here is for Clark County District Court Judge Department Number Five. We currently have uh, Judge Carolyn Ellsworth, and we have Fung Jefferson. And we're going to be going at it for Department Number Five. So how we're going to start off? We're just going to come down our panel. We're going to let them each ask a question, and then you just respond as you see fit. And panel members, uh, because we do have a large panel today. Let's start off by asking uh, one question first, and that way everybody has a chance. If someone wants to pass a question on to someone else, please do so, because we're very limited with time with this large panel. So why don't we start off on the end, since Karen's sitting on the end there, we'll start off with Karen. Good morning, ladies, and thank you for joining us and um, allowing yourselves to be publicly humiliated. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, I would like to actually start by, instead of asking you questions, having you tell me about who you are, what you want us to know about you. So let's start with you, your name, and what you're running for, and um, just tell us a little bit about you and what you want. Okay. Uh, my name is Fung Jefferson. I'm running for District Court Department 5, which is a Clark County uh, life oak. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Nevada. Uh, my family moved here in 1982 when my father was transferred here from Nellis Air Force Base. I had the privilege of growing up here, going to El Dorado High School, uh, graduating from UNLV. Graduating from UNLV, and um, I actually went to law school prior to the William Boyd School of Law being opened. I've been practicing for over 10 years. I've had my own law firm since 2003. Um, I've been in private practice for that period of time. My practice has been based primarily on referrals um, through the community. Um, when I opened up my firm, I had five uh, clients who kind of egged me on on doing that, and I did that, and they've supported me throughout my career. Um, uh, within my years of practice, I have uh, worked in the criminal uh, arena. I have done family law. I've actually argue, argued a case before the Nevada Supreme Court uh, pro bono because my client at the time did not have money, um, but I felt that his uh, rights under the law were uh, sufficient for me to go ahead and uh, argue his cause. Um, I'm seeking uh, election because I believe that it's time for me to give back to my community. My community has supported me in my practice. Um, and I'm ready to go ahead and do public service and represent uh, on the bench. Very good, thank you. Thank you. And now you. Thank you. Um, my name is Carolyn Ellsworth. I'm the sitting judge in Department 5. I was appointed by the governor in October, October 17th, after the Judicial Selection Committee uh, sent my name along with two others uh, to the governor for the final selection. Um, I first moved to Las Vegas in 1979 um, upon graduation from Southwestern University Law School in Los Angeles. 
I was uh, I came here because I was hired uh, as a law clerk with the district attorney's office. At that time, all lawyers basically clerked for one year because there was an unconstitutional residency requirement to take the bar, and uh, that was declared unconstitutional some years after um, I was admitted to the bar. So I clerked for one year. I had uh, taken the bar in California just before I was upon my graduation from law school and was admitted to the bar in California in 1979, that November. And I took the, the bar when it was given at that time, it was only once a year, in July of 1980 and was passed that and was admitted in October, and at which time I became a deputy district attorney. I was in the district attorney's office a total of 11 years. Uh, I was promoted to chief deputy district attorney in uh, 1985 and I uh, served the last five years as chief deputy in charge of the major fraud and corruption unit. Um, I also tried approximately 100 jury trials while I was a deputy district attorney, including capital murder cases. Um, uh, then Steve Wynn uh, asked me if I would um, come to work for him as his chief litigation counsel at what was then Golden Nugget became later Mirage Resorts. And so I worked um, doing all of their in-house litigation for 10 years. Um, I started just, my secretary from the DA's office came with me and um, when um, I left after the merger, we had um, a unit of myself, two other attorneys, uh, and law clerks, um, as well as support staff. So, um, uh, let's see. Also, during the my time both in the DA's office and with Mirage Resorts, I. Uh, wrote legislation and, and got it passed through the legislature, so I'm uh, familiar with that. Um, in the DA's office, I also wrote the child support um, or child uh, abuse protocol for the office for um, the handling of child abuse and child death cases in the office of, um, of the district attorney. After 10 years with Mirage Resorts, um, Upon the merger with MGM, I decided to go out into private practice, and I, uh, I went into practice with a friend for a while, and um, I was in practice a to a private practice a total of seven years. During that time, I did primarily employment litigation for employees, um, so I did discrimination cases uh, under the Civil Rights Act of 1968 as amended, so age, uh, also the uh, Age Discrimination Act, and so I did age, race, ethnic origin, uh, gender uh, discrimination, as well as ADA litigation, both employment and um, access, access, accessibility under Title III of the ADA. Um, I did, I also represented the um, uh, disabled 501c group here in Las Vegas pro bono during that time. I also served um, as the, uh, a board member and um, president, two-term president of uh, We Can, working to eliminate child abuse and neglect. Um, I'm also a pilot, and um, so I got into defense uh, and plaintiff's aviation litigation, so that became a big part of my practice, as well as business litigation. In 2007, Secretary of State Ross Miller asked me to joined him as his chief of enforcement in the securities division of the Secretary of State's office. So I took that position and then in 2009, he, February of 2009, he promoted me to be the securities administrator for the division. So top cop enforcing our blue sky law, um, both criminally and civilly in Nevada. And then, um, so, and then um, in, uh, I submitted for the appointment and was appointed to the bench in October of uh, this past year, in 2011. Um, I am, I've been married 32 years to my wonderful husband, Craig. I have three children, um, Richard, 27, who I'm very proud of. He is um, a, a Naval Flight Officer in the United States Navy, and he just got back from deployment. Um, I was able to put off my investiture so he could be here for that. Uh, he was serving on the George H.W. Bush Flies the Growler, um, which is electronic attack warcraft, uh, aircraft um, 
and uh, he's now being redeployed to Japan March 1st, so for 18 months. Um, my daughter, Elizabeth, 25, she works for a law firm, and my son, Jackson, 13, is in middle school, and his full-time job is to be a student and get good grades. Um, that's, I, you know, that's my quick, I could, you know, I, <laughs> I also taught at the evidence at the, at the college, at the community college, and I was the special assistant United States attorney, and, you know, but that's the quick version. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> 32 years. And let's go back down the panel. Uh, next up is uh, Mr. Travis Barrett. Good morning, Judge. Thanks for being here. How long can a police officer detain somebody in a DUI stop? Well, um, there has to be a reasonable period of time, um, depending, of course, on the initial detention. Um, if there's reasonable suspicion to believe, then a probable cause to believe that the person is intoxicated, then obviously they can place them under arrest. You're talking the original Terry stop? I'm talking about prior to a reasonable suspicion. All right. Well, obviously, um, you can't stop someone without a reasonable suspicion. So, um, well, my, again, my question how long can a police officer hold somebody in a DUI check? Oh, at a DUI checkpoint. Um, well, the, the case law basically indicates that um, it has to be a reasonable amount of detention, so there is no hard and fixed um, rule for that, but um, there have been cases where detention has been allowed up to an hour. Thank you. Ms. Jefferson, uh, give me your opinion of the current state of the coroner's inquest. Um, I believe it's a work in prog. I believe it's a work in progress. Um, <laughs> I believe it's currently in a work in. Pro it's a work in progress. Um, I know that uh, there has been. It's been called into criticism, and that uh, that I do believe that how it was working that, that there was an appearance of uh, conflict with how that process is working. Um, but other than that, I have no further opinion on it. I just know it's something that does need to be fixed in light of how it appears to the public and as how, how it goes with regards to the recent events that have happened in this community. Would you like to just weigh in on that, Judge Jefferson? I mean, uh, Judge Ellsworth. Uh, well, obviously, I, I actually uh, was, while I was in the DA's office, conducted a coroner's inquest in a shooting case, and the problem has been the community needs transparency in the process. Um, now, that being said, um, I was recently looking at the statutes on the coroner's inquest because there's statutory provisions for how an inquest needs to be conducted. And so I, 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 the new procedures that were passed by the county commission have not been tested uh, legally as to whether they violate the statutes. I don't know whether they will or not, but because of that, I can't really weigh in, because it could come before me. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first question is for Judge Hill. First, uh, first of all, I want to thank you, your, your son for his service. appreciate that. And um, um, with regards to your experience as a securities administrator, I'd like to know um, as briefly as you can where do you stand on the issue of white collar crime here in Nevada? Well, um, not only during my time as the securities administrator, but I, I ran the consumer fraud unit under Bob Miller as the DA, and then the major fraud unit under Rex Bell. So white collar crime is one of my specialties, and um, it's a very big problem. As we know, um, it's often not given proper attention by the courts. Either the judges won't try the cases because they feel they're, they're too long and difficult to handle, sometimes even at the justice court level. They don't want to hear the prelims, um, so they often have to take them through the grand jury process. Um, and then at sentencing, it's not taken seriously. I take it very seriously because what I found um, was that the majority of victims of white collar crime are seniors because they have the money and when you're looking to to steal money from people you go to where the money is and so 
when someone has their life savings stolen from them, they don't have the ability at the age of 75 or 80 uh, to earn that back. They took their whole life to earn that, and it can be more devastating than a violent crime, and yet it's treated as if, oh, well, okay. Um, thank your father for his time in the service. I did 21 years in the Air Force, and um, I appreciate all the uh, pro bono stuff and volunteer stuff you have done. It speaks a lot of you. I would like to know where you stand on veterans' issues in the community. I have a history. <laughs> I was one of the. I was a military brat, and those who've grown up in the military. We understand that term. Um, my position is that um, one, when you commit an offense, you have to take responsibility for that. Um, just because you're a veteran doesn't give you an excuse for committing that offense. However, in my work with working with indigent defendants, um, I know that I've seen a lot of veterans who come in and have trauma as a result of their service for the country including um, drug, alcohol, um, and other medical issues. And I believe that um, not taking away their uh, responsibility for their acts that they have, there, should, there are mitigating circumstances. And in some cases, um, they need assistance. And I believe that's why um, the legislature enacted our, uh, a veterans court, or monies for the veterans court. And so I think that in the legal system, um, it's not just with veterans, it's people with mental health issues, um, uh, you know, drug issues, where I think that the system should give back and take in consideration when they're implementing the punishment. It's not just a punishment, but to help them to get back on their feet. First off, I want to thank both of you for coming in and answering our questions. We appreciate it. My first question is for uh, Judge Ellsworth. What is Assembly Bill 187? I don't know. You, if you can tell me what, what it is, then I okay. can probably Assembly Bill 187 was one that established Veterans Court oh, okay. in 2009. So based on that, can you give me what is your, in that bill, they classify what an eligible defendant is. What would you consider if you had a veteran come into your courtroom? What would you know, be your uh, train of thought on who would be eligible to go to veterans court? And well, the point of the legislation was to help veterans and to, to divert them into the, the veterans court program or truly what we have functioning in our court is within the drug and DUI court um, a veteran's component. Um, and so you're looking at a defendant, um, it's not just is he a veteran or is she a veteran, but is to, to be qualified under the statute, there has to be a component of are they um, an alcoholic or drug addicted or post-traumatic stress as a result of their service, and if you think this, um, you could divert them into the veterans uh, section within drug court or DUI court. Now, obviously, we also have that those courts available to citizens who are not veterans. So the focus of the bill was to try and target veterans who have those specific problems, and that's what I've done in my court. I just um, sent a Korean War veteran to the drug court to deal with his chronic alcoholism and, and Judge Delaney was able to get bring the VA um, in to address his problems because um, he didn't need to go to prison. Okay. And then my question for uh, Ms. Jefferson is, under that, in that bill, it actually only covers misdemeanors for veterans to be eligible. If they commit a felony, they are not eligible for veterans court. Do you find there might be mitigating circumstances in which a felony would justify a veteran to be able to be eligible for veterans? Essentially, the legislature has already spoken on that. Um, they've taken a position on that. 
I believe every case is different, every crime is different. Um, that's why we don't have a just standard, you're doing this much time for this crime. You have to look at the whole picture. Um, I do know that uh, the few felons I've gone to trial with or negotiated with, um, the circumstances that I had with those cases, there was drugs involved, but the severity of the crime, it outweighed um, their, their underlying condition to where um, the safety of the community was, should have been looked out for more than um, their underlying mitigating circumstances. Um, I do know that uh, within the prison systems there are programs within the system to assist them um, as they serve their time out uh, with regards to that. Richard Hawkins, and I'll give you a question from the trenches then. WizNet, our electronic filing system. Good question. <laughs> There's the nerve. Uh, is it fine? Should it be replaced? Should it be improved? What can be done? Uh, go ahead. Having to use that <laughs> and get training multiple times with my staff is not perfect. Um, it, uh, compared to the federal system, totally underproductive. Um, I, my concerns with that, uh, with clients, is that we have to pay for it, and we have to pass that on to the clients. In the federal system, you don't have to do that. It, it, so I think it, it limits some people access to the legal system. Um, with regards to getting information, sometimes it's delayed. Um, I get the idea of when they, I, I understand their purpose in trying to implement it. It was supposed to be more efficient, but um, my personal experience with it, it's bogged down um, the process. And I believe that's why right now um, civil cases have to be filed on WizNet, but criminal cases do not because of that lag. So yes, it's a work in progress still. Well, I fortunately, um, left private practice before they implemented the mandatory WISNET filing, although I was familiar with the mandatory federal filing. Um, and as Ms. Jefferson says, the, the federal system is, I think, much better. And I, I too, share the concern that um, I think what it, what it was all about was the cost shifting, that, <laughs> that before, um, you know, they basically said, okay, if we don't have to maintain all this paper, we don't have to pay for maintaining of the paper. And in fact, you know, they've, they took the file room in the RJC and they're building out the new courtrooms where they used to keep the paper files. But the lawyers are still having to um, provide courtesy copies because it's impossible for us to read all this stuff on Odyssey, even though we have it electronically. I sit in front of my computer until I'm just about to go crazy and then say to my law clerk, did somebody file a courtesy copy so I can, and I, I also take a lot of work home and although I can, uh, you know, I can, so I can work at night and although I can access uh, Odyssey from my home, uh, it, reading things on the computer, the way it's set up for us is impossible. You just, scroll one page at a time, and you can't flip back and forth easily. So it's a nightmare. So I guess I'm just old fashioned, I like my paper. Yeah, okay, so for, for those listening, we, we have to pay, I think it's a $3 fee, plus 3%, 350, I'm sorry, plus 3% of filing fees as a service charge to the WizNet company. Meanwhile, the clerk's office doesn't have to pay the clerks that used to do this, which is where the attorney preparation comes in. But a, a follow up on that. I mean, WizNet's the only thing I've ever seen that has me say nice things about the federal PACER system, which is bad enough. <laughs> but um, the WizNet, unlike PACER, takes an actual review by a clerk in the office for a couple, sometimes two, three, four days uh, before we get an approval or a rejection. What happens if the statute of limitations expires on the filing of a civil case between that's uploaded to WizNet and the rejection. Good question, and I'd like to know. I don't know. <laughs> and so my, I can tell you that in my office, um, 
we make sure that we don't wait to the last minute because of that. Um, as a practice, even prior to WISNET coming into effect, you had the same problem with the runner service because if you sent it out the day before, you know, the day of or the day before, and it got rejected, and the runner service didn't know, you missed the statute. But um, I think it's a different instance with the uh, uh, WISNET system because you could do it two days before and not find out it was rejected until after the statute uh, has passed. So. I'm not familiar with how that's going to be handled or how that is handled because I haven't experienced that. I think it would depend on what was what's the reason they're rejecting. Uh, um, the, the, I, I don't even know yet. I mean, I, I've seen some that were rejected that shouldn't have been. Um, I've seen some that went on to. I saw one go into La La Land that never even got to a clerk to review. Um, I, I think that the statute would not run if. If it was a, a matter of it went into cyberspace and was lost, uh, and it was otherwise a legitimate pleading, I mean, this, the, the statute would, would be told. Okay, okay if, I could, if I could go back to the original thing, should something be done, and if so, what? My experience, I say yes. As to what, I don't know because I'm not part of that process. I, I'm, I'm the end user. Um, I understand there's a lot of um, other, you know, other considerations in uh, that system, um, and so I, I couldn't tell you what can be done because I don't know the inner workings of that system. I, I think if we, uh, I mean, it's, it's a matter of a contract with with Usenet and that could certainly be changed. Obviously, when you change a, a filing system, um, you get into having to redo something that they, it took years to implement in the first place. So I don't know, because I don't, I don't have to use it, never had to use it. Um, I looked things up on WISNET in the Secretary of State's office, um, because, of course, I didn't, that was before Odyssey was in place. And, um, but as far as, is there another option? I don't, I don't know. Uh, we actually only have uh, just about two minutes left on this panel. So, um, Ms. UNLV, if you'd like to ask a quick question, and please uh, limit your uh, answers to about 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, Judge Ellsworth, I am just curious, you've worked in the casino industry, what is your take on the culinary union and their attack ads against station casinos and their harassment tactics to get stations employees to join the union? That, that's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I would sustain an objection assumes facts not <laughs> um, Actually, I just heard a, a long a, a debate by both sides. They were on uh, public radio weighing in on that very issue. Um, I understand um, the positions of both sides, but it's it's not something because. It's not likely to come before me, but it potentially could. I mean, it's more an NLRB issue, um, as you know. Um, but I don't want, because it is ongoing, and because there, there could be some, uh, potential, something that would come before me on injunctive matter, I can't really weigh in. Okay. I understand the issues on both <laughs> sides, having been on both sides. Mm -hmm. Ms. Jefferson, you got um, if you want to add, that's fine. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> very well put. Thank you very much. Well, um, Judge Ellsworth and Ms. Jefferson, we appreciate you opening yourselves up to veterans of politics in our panel and giving us your time to sit down and actually chat with us. So thank you very much. Yeah, I don't know. 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 I don't know.